Greetings, one and all. This is Dr. David Roots coming to you on David Roots TV. An exciting and informative topic, one that is close to my heart, one that I'm very passionate about. The title is Examining Chemical Practices in Pre Colonial Africa. Really important for me. By profession, I am a science teacher with my preferred specialization or specialism in chemistry, uh, something that I've been into from being, from as a young child, I was keen and interested in chemistry, the sciences in general, but chemistry in particular. And I had an affinity for fantasy and mythology that related to chemistry, such as alchemy and wizardry, magic. So as I got older and became more formally educated, I gravitated towards the study of chemistry from a professional and academic level. Um, so I could inform that original interest with things that are real and applicable to everyday life. So this is an important topic coming from a Pan-African point of view, an Afrocentric point of view, and combining it with my my early life passions, it's important for me and for those students who I teach who are, who are of African descent to understand that the practice of what we call chemistry, which is the study of the relationships between matter, physical matter, the chemical relationships, is something that has been in existence in many societies, including Africa, from before colonial times, so before people from Europe came to Africa. So we're gonna examine that today. We're gonna to examine it in a brief fashion because this is a huge, huge topic, and it's really just gonna be a cursory sort of anecdotal look at some of the chemical practices that students who have a more uh, desirous interests can go and do further research themselves. There's no way you could cover this. This is these types of practices. Each individual one could be a whole university course unto itself. So it's more just a, a chance to reflect and to spark an interest and register, register the activity in regards to chemistry that was taking place in pre-colonial Africa. Now, having said that, last statement I said ties in nicely with this one. From an academic, a scientist, a uh, chemical historian as such, um, Clapperton Shakanetsa Movanga. I believe he's from Zambia. I might be wrong. Please look him up. I give you the links throughout the slides, and his link is here. He states in one of his articles that he's written that not simply Western chemistry in African hands, but African originated ideas and modes of chemistry and the implications of taking these historical, ph philosophical, cultural and technical understandings seriously with respect to Africa's sustainable development. He was referring to the study of African chemistry and saying that, if we break down his statement, that we don't want to look simply for Western science being studied in Africa, in particular, in this case, chemistry. We want to look at science and chemistry in particular that has come out of the unique cultural and indigenous application needed by Africans from Africans themselves. This is a really important point for me in particular, because there's been a lot of interest in 2020, the time of recording this video, of this term decolonizing education. And this speaks to the heart of decolonizing education, decolonizing science, decolonizing other topics too, but in this case, chemistry. That it's not simply about black washing or Africa washing or romanticizing uh, Africa and, and, and sort of, 
what's the word, kind of laying over, plastering Western science done by Africans and calling that African science. We want to look specifically at science and chemistry that has originated out of, as he says, out of the needs, historical, philosophical, cultural, and technical understandings arising on the continent itself. And that's how I've framed this, this video and the content of this video. These are the types of practices that I'm referring to. Yes, some of these practices will have evolved and, and, and come about in other places around the world. But we're looking at the unique aspects of how Africans would have practiced them. So it was important for me to preface this short video with that sentiment. Another issue we need to address is that oftentimes when we talk about black history, when we talk about black blacks within science, most of the time you get this sort of thing. You get American you people from the United States of America and scientists and their contributions, okay, which is very important to, to recognize the contributions, um, in particular because the United States of America has, has played such a huge role in the development of technology over time around the world. So any work by black scientists, scientists of African descent, man or woman, that took place in America potentially has influenced actions and activities around the world. However, we cannot limit ourselves to America and the United States of America being the sole place where black excellence, excellence by those of African descent within this field, AKA science or any other field takes place. Increasingly, we need to in fact look more to other parts of the world, in particular the African continent, for examples of this black excellence, especially in respect to, as we said in the second slide, of finding and celebrating ideas that relate to original African thought and the original application of science and chemistry to African problems in indigenous ways. So yes, we want to celebrate the history of black scientists, as it says, but it lists, as far as I can tell, mostly scientists that have done their work in the United States of America or associated with the United States of America. And we need to start to move away from that and, and widen our appreciation. So let's get into the actual PowerPoint. These are the five areas that I'm going to be focusing on. And as I said, each one of these areas alone is in terms of the African understanding and the African application is a course unto itself. Not only the science behind it, but the history and cultural implications across uh, geographies of, of, of political geographies like so-called tribes and nations across industries, you know, this is really just a way to pique interest and to register this, un this understanding for people who are passionate about the field. So these are the five we're going to look at. Smelting, glass manufacture, soap manufacture, salt manufacture, and alcohol manufacture. And it's interesting that chemistry, from the African perspective in this regard, especially with these five, a focus on methods of production, methods of pro producing raw materials. Some, not necessarily for uh, industrial purposes, such as the glass manufacture, but even the glass manufacture, the production of beads at some point would have been for the use in economies. But in this case, we're going to look at it from more of a, a traditional a ceremonial aspect. But the others, very much industrial and production based, which says that having an understanding of chemistry for those of African descent could be very important or is very important in terms of economic empowerment, empowerment 
and attempting to found that economic empowerment at the grassroots primary level in terms of the production base. Africa has always been a market driven society based off of the production of goods that can be traded. And so the use of chemistry to extract and to uh, manipulate natural materials into tradable and useful goods and materials and products is key to doing that, both from a simplistic level and from a more advanced level. It was in the past and it will be in the future. But let's look for us at smelting. This has been covered a lot in the academic realm in terms of the ethnographic, historical and cultural relationship uh, of smelting to societies. Uh, but it's also been covered from a chemical perspective, probably not as advertised as much. Smelting refers to the extraction of pure metals from their ores. And so we know that the thing about metal ores is even though they contain metal, they're not as useful as the pure metal. Pure metals have those properties that we all learn about in high school or in secondary school. They're malleable, good conductors of heat, okay, can be shaped, ductile, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So any use of metals such as in weaponry or in, 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 in artwork such as mask, jewelry, required an, an understanding of the smelting process. And of course, Africa in its diversity has used metals in those various ways across the continent. And so it has a history, a long history of smelting. So here, the article talks about early iron smelting in Central Africa more than 2,500 years ago. So that's long before colonial, a colonialism of Africa. The people near Lake Victoria began smelting iron in tall furnaces that produced a remarkable heat. Okay, and this particular article talks all about that. Scanning very quickly, it says in the early 1950s, people of the Bohunde tribe in southern Zaire made a curious find while digging for sand not far from the village. They found a group of clay objects resembling rough bricks, many of them decorated with circular or linear impressions. Okay, two investigations from the Institute for Scientific Research in Central Africa came and investigated and saw that it was a furnace for the smelting of iron. Okay, the type of technology that still takes place today for the smelting of iron in a blast furnace which is run by very, very high heat, lots of energy required. These Africans uh, in pre-AD were using a similar technology, but obviously on a much smaller scale. And there are some ways they have been able to find or to, to, to nest this uh, smelting activity in this very ancient time period. And a lot of that is based off of the materials that they were able to find in the, the residue around the smelting furnaces. And here I put some, some information from deeper in the article. You can go and read it yourself. But not only did they have the iron ore, which is where they're gonna derive the iron from, and uh, carbon, but they also found other materials that would help them to, to link the smelting to such a long time period ago because smelting would have been done over many, many uh, time periods uh, in Africa. As far as the chemistry of smelting, some notes that students of chemistry can go and do the research if they don't understand already. Smelting involves the taking of an ore 
whether it's that iron ore, aluminium ore, copper ore, in this case iron oxide, and reducing it using usually using carbon, which can be made as a form of charcoal. So the raw materials of having the iron ore were present in Africa, as well as the raw material for creating charcoal, which is just trees itself, were also there. They also need the conditions of very high temperatures, which is done via the way of what we call bellows, which are large airbags that can be made from animal skins. And it talks about this, this ancient technology within the article. There are other sources as well. Again, from Wikipedia, it shows that this highly advanced aspect of chemistry, the smelting process, which we still know takes place today all around the world and such is such is is of such importance because many of the materials that we need in everyday life are made from metals like iron, aluminium, and copper, just to name three. While this smelting process was taking place in pre-colonial Africa. It says here, even though the origins of iron smelting are difficult to date by radiocarbon, there are fewer problems with using it to track the spread of ironworking after 400 BC. Okay, so in the 1960s, it was suggested that ironworking was spread by speakers of Bantu languages. Um, although it has been proposed that no words for iron or ironworking can be traced to reconstructed proto Bantu, the toponymy in West Africa, such as Ilion, suggests otherwise. So in other words, they're saying that there are words for iron and iron working in pre-colonial Africa that help them to directly link the process to those time periods. It, all, it also says, as I said earlier, the archaeological evidence clearly indicates that iron spread with the development of cereal agriculture from southern Tanzania and northern Zambia starting in the first century BC. So we have evidence of very, very ancient production of metals using furnaces as well as more recent but still very ancient evidence and archaeological evidence for this highly valuable chemical practice. Let's move on to the next one, which is glass production. So this article talks about early primary glass production in southern Nigeria. And the abstract says that fragmentary glass working crucibles and drawn glass beads and ritual glass objects uh, were analyzed using scanning electron microscopy and other techniques. And because they were able to find some very unusual constituents of this glass, they were able to separate it from the production that might have infiltrated uh, Africa, in particular Nigeria in this case, from others known in Europe. Okay, so this is an indigenous production, an indigenous method of producing glass. In this case, it was for decorative uh, purposes and traditional purposes within Yoruba. Um, however, the production itself of glass is hugely important because by producing their primary materials, such as beads and necklaces, you then also have materials that can be traded and that suggests economy. So in this case, when it comes to the chemistry, because that's what we want to focus on, the chemistry of glass, glass is generally made from sand, but you also have very other very sorry, other very important materials that are needed to embellish the glass making process. One, so that you can get the, the uh, crystallization of the glass that's required, as well as 
some represent impurities that need to be removed. So here we see that the glass that they found has some very high contents of high lime, meaning calcium oxide, and high alumina, meaning aluminium oxide. Okay, and so those things give it its its very unique chemical composition that's separated from the other other processes. Now, how is glass making a chemical process? Well, the conditions needed for glass making are not only the react the reactants. And glass is not just a is doesn't just change. It is is not a physical change. It's a chemical change because the constituents inside the glass actually change in chemical makeup. You need very high temperature, okay? And you melt the glass under this high temperature. Sorry, the, you melt the components underneath this high temperature. But because of the reactivity and the inter the 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 interatomic forces between the constituents, crystallization of glass then occurs, which I have in another slide coming up. So here I just put some information, um, the, the link is above, that talks about the different materials that go into glass. So you have the formers, which typically tend to be the silicon dioxide in a form of sand. Okay. The fluxes, which lower the temperature at which the formers will melt, okay, and it talks about things like soda and potassium carbonate could be used in that way. And then you have stabilizers, which make the glass strong and water resistant. So in that particular um, article, you do go into the materials that are there, but they don't necessarily say whether or not formers, fluxes, or stabilizers. Over time, obviously through the indigenous practices, those glass makers would have been able to figure out what worked best in order to get the type of glass that they wanted. And so, even though they might not have known the specific chemical properties by name as modern day science might identify it, they would have had an understanding of the necessary components, the necessary amounts to get the type of glass production that they wanted. And here we give a little chemical background to the formation of glass. And you can see in here in the first diagram that the atom of, atoms of silica, which is silicon dioxide, they won't have time, sorry, silicon um, yep, dioxide, they don't have time to line up. So when you melt sand and then you cool it down quickly, the silicon dioxide components, molecules, do not line up in a crystalline fashion. But when they introduce these other um, chemicals, like the formers, the formers, the fluxes, the stabilizers, okay, they allow the glass molecules to line up in a more crystalline fashion. And they say here, you can see here's the silicon dioxide molecule. And because this sodium carbonate has been added, you can see the sodium here acting in polarity to the oxygen and giving the glass molecules a defined structure. And they say, this is the glass you see every day in jars and windows. And it's the glass that's used in composites. In fact, it used to be called soda glass to distinguish it from quartz. As you know, of quartz, quartz can be quite transparent, but not as clear as the type of glass that we have today in things like glasses and windows. So the use of these chemicals that they talk about, lime, the aluminum, suggests a highly informed 
chemical knowledge, whereas they're not just melting sand. And even if you try to melt sand just on its own, because it has such a high melting point as a giant covalent molecule, such a very high melting point, that you're going to need the addition of these other materials, which they call the fluxes, fluxes to cause that former to melt. And so we must celebrate this ancient glass making. This is just one record of it from this article here in the Journal of African Archaeology. We must celebrate this as another ancient and early chemical process that Africans were conducting. Moving on to our third chemical process, what we call saponification, aka soap making. For someone like myself, most of the soap I buy is traditional Afri what's called traditional African black soap. Um, it's a it's a very pure soap in the sense of I don't like to use that word pure, but natural is a better word. It's a very natural soap because all of the materials that are used in the traditional process of of the making the African black soap um, are natural naturally derived material. And there's been some studies, not as much as I had wanted to when I looked up the research, that have investigated the chemical process and chemical properties of the soap and the soap making process, what we call saponification. So you can see here, African black soap in this article, Physiochemical Properties of African Black Soap, and its comparison with industrial black soap. It says African black soap was made from local materials, which includes alkali from cocoa pods, ash, palm kernel oil, aloe vera, and honey. Now, in the saponification process, soaps are generally easy to make because all you need is an alkali substance, such as sodium hydroxide, and a fat. And in this case, they're using the cocoa pods ash, which is probably going to contain potassium salts, which when you add it to water, will form a alkaline solution. And you combine that with the palm kernel oil, and in some cases, shea butter, oil from the shea butter nut tree, and you're going to get a soap. So here you see on the right-hand side, the materials and saponification. You have some aspect of fats, some oil, and an alkali. You also need to heat these at a high temperature. And here I've given the basic chemical reaction that takes place in saponification. On the left, in this particular diagram, we have the triglyceride, aka the fat. And here we have sodium hydroxide, which acts as the alkali. And you get the soap molecule here. Okay, a fatty acid salt that's labeled down here. Fatty acid salt, why? Because you have the C to double bond O and the O here. So almost like a carboxylic acid in a sense, but it has this, it's a salt because it also has the ionic attachment to the sodium molecule. And this arm, this arm on the right, here you have a 14, 15 chain carbon. That depends on the oil that you use. So you could use any oil to really create that aspect of the soap. And the way that soap works is, is that you have this dual polarity. You have the plus side here and the minus side here. And so soap can then interact with fats and it can interact with with water and when you use it now to wash your skin or your clothes the water has a, a certain polarity and the fats have a certain polarity for other fats okay 
and you can wash away uh, once the fats interact with the the other fats, whether that be oils from your skin or something that you've spilt or something like that. Uh, it can then help to clean you because those fats get attached to this molecule and can be washed away with water because the water also has an affinity to that molecule. So this is a process of making soap and it's something that's been done traditionally in Africa for quite some time. I have a definition down here that is worth visiting. Saponification can be defined as, hydra as a hydration reaction. So that's the addition of water where free hydroxide breaks the ester bonds between the fatty acids and glycerol of a triglyceride. So that's here. This is the ester bond. Okay. Ester bond, I should say. That's the C to O, the carbonyl group, to this oxygen, to another carbon. So that's going to be broken. And you can see a sodium is now going to attach there. And it says here, which are each soluble in aqueous solution. So that's what I was just describing. That water now can interact with both sides and wash, wash it away. But the soap will also attach itself to the oils as well. Hence why you get a residue when you use soap in the bath. It's, you leave behind a residue and that residue is the fats attaching itself to the oils coming from your skin or your hair or whatever you're washing with. So really interesting um, in terms of the chemistry behind saponification and the fact that traditional African society, they've been practicing this chemistry, highly advanced knowledge of chemistry for so long and using natural materials. The benefit of using natural materials, of course, is that they're non-toxic, not only to yourself, but to the environment. Whereas modern soaps contain lots of perfumes, perfumes that are developed from, from unnatural uh, chemicals such as esters and aldehydes and ketones and so on and so on that are not really good for us. <clears throat> so taking a look at that article, it says the potash, which is the potassium salt made from the, the cocoa pods, can be derived from the ashes of several plant sources, including cocoa buds, shade tree bark, plantain leaves, plantain leaves. Okay, really important. And it's made with handmade potash in small batches. So they're just talking about the benefits and the differences between that and the larger factory made soaps, including the black soap. Here, a brief history of the African black soap. Here is the link if you want to look it up. It says African black soap originates from the western part of Africa in age-old Yoruba communities. The making of this soap began in pre-colonial Yoruba land. So we're talking again about pre-colonial Africa and the recipe has since been passed down from mother to daughter. We have to remember that Yoruba is, uh, is a tradition, a people that is not limited to modern day Nigeria, but formed Yoruba land and Yoruba people stem from all the way from the Gold Coast, what we now call Ghana, all the way down to what we now call Nigeria and other parts of Africa, of West Africa. And so this chemical knowledge specifically passed down, interestingly enough, in women's guilds is very important for us to recognize. The chemical industry of soap is so important to the world's, world's economy that it's probably understated in many regards. We cannot just think of it as something we use domestically in the home, but also used on an industrial purpose, um, uh, industrial scale, the use of soaps and for many, many purposes. So understanding that chemistry is very, very vital uh, to developing further industries and, ver and further products that's worth recognizing.
And this just gives a bit more about the materials and methods with which I think I've gone over enough. Um, again, talking about the benefits of African black soap, especially the traditionally made African black soap compared to the factory made African black soap, as well as talking about the materials and methods, which we talked about as well. Here, in this aspect of the article, I like how they talk about the particular ingredients will, will change according to the geography and biology of those areas. So I believe this, this is meant to say coastal regions tend to use more coconut oil, whereas savannah regions tend to use more shea butter, which is a more hardier plant that can survive drier conditions. So interesting enough that depending on the regionality of the African black soap, the chemistry also will change. The type of triglyceride that is used and found within the black soap will change according to the places where they are made. And that's a very uh, important point looking at the, the uniqueness of the chemical process. Let's continue to move on at this look of chemical pro processes and practices in pre-colonial Africa. And we're reminding ourselves that we are really trying to study and embed those pra practices that are indigenous and not just copies of European and other uh, political geographies and states such as you know America and, and things like that but actual chemical processes that originated out from Africa and served the needs of Africans in those particular places where they originated. In this regard we can also look at salt making okay and here is a very good map that talks about salt production and flow, the main sources and the flow pattern of salt across Sub-Saharan Africa. And here's the link if you want to find more information about it. And as you can see, the majority of the salt production is coming from coastal regions. Coming from coastal regions and then being transported across the continent. So here's a chemical industry that is not just local and not just regional, but trans-regional. And thereby the chemistry behind it then becomes even more significant. Now, in many ways, the production of salt is dependent on physical characteristics. So the evapor Evapor evaporation process of water leaving behind salt. So in this case, very highly brine salt lakes. So places where the sea has been cut off, leaving behind highly salty water. And that water then is separated from the main body of water by the use of salt pans and then allowed to evaporate in the strong sun along that equatorial region that blankets much of Africa. So that's very much a, a, a physical process. But the materials within the salt definitely have chemical property properties that make it useful. While the physical process is important for the extraction of the raw material, it's the chemistry and the biochemistry uh, interactions in terms of how it's applied that make it really useful. Just taking a quick look at this article down here, it says of around 181.5 million tons of global soil production, 
around 5 million tons is produced in Africa. <clears throat> So production techniques in many sub-Saharan African countries are conventional and in some areas primitive. Okay, so it talks about that, that aspect of the primitive nature of soil production. So when we talk about soil production, we also have to mention the whole aspect of ionized versus non-ionized salts many of the salts we get that are done commercially have iodine supplemented within the salts to help pre prevent iodine deficiencies but salts that are purely made during evaporatory processes will not contain iodine at least in any large amounts so here again, that's another aspect of the chemistry that has to be appreciated within the salt making process. When we look at salt making, specifically the so-called primitive salt making and pre-colonial aspects of salt making, a very, very good article is written here in this link here, earthwormexpress.com, which sounds a bit of a anecdotal link, but they provide many, many uh, references in this article. This is a very, very good article talking about salt and the ancient people of Southern Africa. And if we look back to that map, we can see that in Southern Africa, this region here, there is lots of salt making, including here in Namibia, where the article focuses on Namibia and South Africa. In the introduction, it says, I'm not an archaeologist or a historian, but I cure meat for a living and have an intense in interest in the history of my trade. I have for years been looking at the origins of salt technology, tracing the many faceted stands that come together, strands that come together in the art of meat curing. Salt is essential in the process. Okay. It says, doing this article brings particular joy since it deals with his home time. I've been to many of the areas I talk about, and with that, we walk the land of the Ko and the San, okay, which are places, which are a people, peoples in Namibia, who in derogatory terms are referred to as the, the Bushmen, um, the San in particular. Okay, so that's the area he's talking about. And in this article, it says that. The conditions for naturally occurring salt is widespread and that there is key pre-colonial evidence for the use of salt in seasoning foods like locust. He says that the process of curing meats like biltong, which is a South African uh, jerky, which is salt is very important in the curing of meats, that that process may have been learned from the Southern African people and that the Southern African people did not like the taste of salted meat, but mainly used the act of roasting meat in ashes and adding seaside plants to that roasting process as a way of adding salt. So rather than using the salt that they were, that was naturally available because there are natural salt pans in those places, including places where the animals would go for salt licks, meaning they, the animals themselves would go to those places to lick the salt, that the, the native people did not really like the taste of salt meat. They would get their salt probably, you know, intuitively understanding over time that the negative impacts of eating salt in its isolated form, they would get their salt from the roasting process of the meat, mixing it with plants from the sea which will contain that salt naturally. So it was really a positive that they did not eat salt and salt their meat like many of the Europeans did when they came to that, those places. So this, this article talks a lot about that. Um, it's a very long article that needs to be read to really appreciate the relationship between salt salt making and the native people that were there like the san and the koi 
and how they understood that process physically, but they seem to have an, an, an understanding of the chemi chemical relevance behind salt and the use of salt by way of their desire not to use it for certain things, but to use it for other things. And he talks about that in his article. So, very important. And of course, salt comes up a bit later on as well, uh, when I'm talking about uh, things like embalming and the use of things like natron in other parts of Africa. And here I talk about natron, which is another form of salt. Okay. So, here we see that natron was not just used in terms of any preserving or curing of meat, but remember we're talking about the chemical, the use of chemistry and chemist chemical ideas within pre-colonial Africa, that this particular salt was used in many processes, some which we've actually already addressed, like saponification, glass making, and of course pre preservation. But in this not in this case, not the for meat to consume, but for the preservation of living tissue when people would die for the embalming process. So here from Wikipedia, you can go and check about Natron with the links also included, that historically natron was harvested directly as a salt mixture from dry lake beds in ancient Egypt. Blended with oil was an early form of soap, okay, undiluted, cleanser for the teeth and early mouthwash. So, I mean, the doctors still today tell us to rinse our mouths with salt, especially if you have any sort of uh, uh, issue in terms of your dental health, or dental hygiene. It was mixed into early antiseptics for wounds and minor cuts. The mineral was also used during mummification. Why? Because the carbonate in natron increases pH, which creates a hostile environment for bacteria. It was also used, interesting enough, added to cast oil to make a smokeless fuel, which allowed Egyptian art artisans to paint elaborate artworks inside ancient tombs without staining them with soot. Really highly applicable uses of a chemical, chemical naturally derived that obviously there was key chemical knowledge about long before the arrival of colonial powers. Finally, in terms of glass making, natron is an ingredient for making a distinct color called Egyptian blue, and also as the flux, which we talked about earlier. The flux was the, the substance that allowed the melting point of the former, which would be sand in most cases, um, to be lowered. So here it says it was used along with sand and lime in cer ceramic and glass making by the Romans and others at least until AD 640. But you can see that the Egyptians were, were also using this, okay? Um, and the Egyptians learned, sorry, the Romans learned lots from the Egyptians, so possibly they also learned this aspect of, of how to use natron as a flux material. What is natron? Why is it considered a salt? Well, let's look at the chemistry behind it. Natron is a naturally occurring mixture of sodium carbonate. We know sodium carbonate or sodium bicarbonate because people use it in the baking process. You can also use sodium bicarbonate in the um, things like in your bath. Okay, it can act as a muscle relax relaxant, muscle relaxer. So sodium carbonate, tine of soda ash. Okay, hence the word soda means sodium. 
So natron is a mixture of sodium carbonate and sodium bicarbonate along with small quantities of sodium chloride and sodium sulfate. So many different salts, aka metals, metals and non-metals, ionic compounds, all in one left behind in these deposits. Natron deposits are sometimes found in saline lake beds which arose in arid environments. In other words, places where there would have been high sea level rise that would have been eventually cut off and then dried up, leaving behind the mineral components. And of course, our ancient ancestors, we need to celebrate the fact that they understood that this very, very valuable substance was valuable because of its chemical composition and chemical properties. Really important to understand that. Let's move on to, I believe, our last chemical practice, one that is universal in its occurrence across nations, that is fermentation or the making of alcohol. And if we know that many ancient societies across the world, both South and North, alcohol and the use of alcohol and for various means, religious purposes, culinary, and, and obviously just, you know, to drink nutritionally, especially in the absence of clean water, the alcohol making is very, very important. And this is the same for Africa and pre-colonial Africa. Now, what is interesting is that, as this article talks about, that fermented beverages, it says, but fermented food has a long history in Africa. And in the next couple of slides, I show the vast range of types of products and foods that result from the fermentation process across Africa, in particular in West Africa, but not just limited to West Africa. So this says in this abstract, processing methods of Oshikundu, a traditional beverage from sub-tribes within Awambo culture in, the, in northern Namibia. It says fermented beverages have a long history in Africa and fermentation is the cheapest, oldest form of food preservation. Indigenous knowledge has been at the forefront of the traditional food and beverage processing technology. And it talks about ocean kundu, okay? And how it's made. And I look here at the chemical process of fermentation, which involves the use basically of some sort of starch or sugar exposed to enzymes, which can come from bacteria or from fungi, such as yeast. And that starch or sugar is broken down through anaerobic respiration. And from that process, chemical process, is made alcohol, in this case, ethanol. So here you can see in this traditional beverage, the main uh, uh, raw material is different brands, such as they're saying here, pearl, millet, flour, and sour gum. Okay, and here you can see boiled water added to the flour. The sour gum um, is added. The brands is, is added for flavor. Add cold water. Add the starter culture, which provides the bacteria and then leave it to ferment. And what is interesting, I believe with this, this particular product, it doesn't take long to make. Here it says, it's a perishable beverage with a shelf life of less than six hours, okay? And it's been brewed from generation to generation. So we're talking about a traditional technology based on chemical practices, really, really important. If we look a bit deeper, as I was saying, fermented foods within Africa are wide ranging across the continent. Here it says some of the most important ones in this group include gari, which is cassava, fermented cassava, which you see in West Africa, ogi, mahuwu from maize, and kafir, which is beer from sawaka. There's also, those are the food materials, <clears throat> but you also have things that are food condiments which are generally made from protein-rich seeds. So this is interesting that they're saying that 
the main meals and beverages are usually products of carbohydrate rich raw materials and the fermentation of that. But then you have condiments such as uru from African locust bean, ugba from African oil bean, and oguri from melon seeds can act as condiments all through the fermentation of protein rich seeds. And all are known to be good sources of proteins and vitamins. So here we have technology chemical technology producing products for nutritional use sometimes taking things that are otherwise toxic like cassava in large amounts and using the fermentation process to detoxify them and make them nutritious in the long run and this technology as we know is is been present from ancient times the ancient Egypt, Egyptians made beer the ancient Ethiopians made beer and still do to this day. From honey wine to other forms of beer made from their grains like teff. So the fermentation process, which is at its heart a chemical process aided by natural organisms, of course, is really critical to understanding chemical practices in pre-colonial Africa. So we come to the end of the presentation and if I may we'll just go back to the beginning close with the original idea that it's important for us people of African descent and those who want to appreciate and promote the idea of African excellence within all fields but in this case within science and particularly in the field of chemistry, need not just to blackwash European chemistry and see chemistry through the eyes of others and what others may do and what others may find is important, but more importantly, as Clapperton Shakonetsa Movangu says, to appreciate and help to bring about African originated ideas and modes of chemistry, particularly those that emanate from our unique perspectives, the unique pers historical perspective, philosophical perspective, cultural perspective, and the development of technical understandings related to these perspectives. Why, as he said in, his, in the finality of that statement, it's necessary with respect to Africa's sustainable development. And I as a Pan-African know that when he refers to Africa, he means Africa at home and abroad. My name is Dr. David Roots. Give thanks and hopefully this presentation has embodied the principles of Pan-African and African excellence that we hope to bring about. Please share it with someone that you think is interested and subscribe to David Roots TV. Thank you. Fire, 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 fire.